All right, everyone. Hopefully, we're live everywhere on YouTube, etc. Welcome to Unsafe Space Book Club. Uh, this month's book is The Ultimate Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or actually just The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is book one. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can take myself off of the main screen and unmute everyone else. So hold on for just a moment. All right, everyone should be allowed to unmute themselves now. Hopefully, Carrie, are you there? And can you speak? Hi, hey guys. All Welcome right, on. it worked. I'm Welcome. Unmuted. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for Book Club this month was fiction. I'm just going to make an announcement right up top. If it's your first time watching Book Club, we alternate between fiction and nonfiction. Next month, we're doing Jordan Peterson's new book, Beyond Order. And if you want to get started on that one, you can join us. And also, if it's your first time participating in the book club, we ask that you just try and mute yourself when you're not talking, because there's oftentimes a lot of background noise that it, the microphone will pick up. So welcome. Hello, everyone. There's a lot of familiar faces and some new people. Hello. So by the, I just on the outside, I kind of want to say about this book, I just like it this was carter's moment of frivolity like i don't expect to have deep discussions about how this relates to society or what anyone predicted or it's just fun that's the only reason i wanted to read it okay can i start with a bomb i think this is going to be spicy because i think this book sucks i think oh, it's good. one of the most boring books that i've ever read and i couldn't even finish it i had to read a synopsis and it's not because i ran out of time you're right it was short but it was pointless I didn't care about any of the characters. Um, I thought the comedy would be better suited for a sketch show or a radio play, which I looked up after the fact. And it I saw was. it was a radio play. And I <laughs> yeah. probably would have enjoyed it in that format. I think I would have enjoyed it in that format. Okay. But um, strong opinion, I know, might be the least popular opinion today. But there you go. <laughs> I'm glad that there's this disagreement. I mean... I liked it, but I don't need to defend it. Like it's not for everyone. I I love it. I think it's funny. So, what anyone else agree with Carrie? Any other like? Haters? I actually have to agree with Carrie on my, on the reading it out thing. Like it just was so absurd, and I ended up buying the Audible edition, which is uh, narrated by Stephen Fry, and oh. that was excellent. That was oh, hilarious. I should have done that. Okay, I he does done such that. a good job. He you know does all these different tones of the different characters. And um, to make it even funnier, I because I actually only finished it about half an hour ago, I sped it up to 1.5, and it's totally <laughs> like a Monty Python. It is like a Monty Python script. Yeah, you so, know what? Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that. I should I should actually uh, finish finish it by listening to audiobook and see if I like it better. Because I before knowing it was a radio play, I had the thought this seems like it's the wrong medium for me to enjoy this, but. Anyway, I actually carry I, I mean, I read it book form a long time ago, but for this one, I just listened to the Stephen Fry. I love that. I've listened to the Stephen Fry one before. It is excellent. The Stephen Fry version is awesome. That's what so. I did, too, actually, is I listened to the Stephen Fry audio version. And this is my first time reading the book and I loved it. But I'm I love Monty Python and that's uh, uh, Fry and Laurie. Uh, show and but I don't mind this in book form I thought it still worked um, but uh, I could see how like some people wouldn't like because it's not a normal novel it's kind of absurdist so it's like when you go into a novel you kind of have some expectations and it's not meeting those expectations it's yeah. definitely absurdist <laughs> I first yeah, read I this in high school it was a it was sophomore year and we had to read two books in the summertime. And the first one was I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And the second one was this one. And when I got into my class, my teacher was like, Oh, I love Maya Angelou. And the second one was the worst book ever. And I thought <laughs> <laughs> I thought the complete opposite. <laughs> I hated my Angelou, but I loved this book. And I have the complete. Ooh, nice. I know. A fancy, right? a fancy copy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what were some other? Uh, did most people enjoy it? And by the way, I love Monty Python also. I, I, 
I forgot until I was halfway through it. I remembered that you had said, Carter, I think, did someone make a comment or something complaining that we were reading this and said, it's like a Monty Python sketch. And yeah. And that didn't, yeah. I didn't remember that until halfway through. And, and I was thinking, yeah, that's a good comparison. But, and I love Monty Python sketches, but I think it was just the, what, who, what, did, what were other people's first impression? Did you laugh out loud? Hey, Gary. I um, I had the same feeling as you because I had no I knew nothing about the book coming into it other than like I had seen like the trailer for the movie that came out and you know some stuff that Carter had said so I thought it was just like a typical science fantasy adventure novel and so like at the very beginning I'm like what is going on this isn't <laughs> what I was expecting so um, like and then I kind of you know caught on eventually but um, yeah, I, I had the same thought as you, where it's like, I was thinking this is kind of like reading about the Three Stooges instead of watching the Three Stooges, <laughs> you know? There you go. <laughs> like, yeah, if you read and then Mo pokes Curly in the eyes, it doesn't really have the same impact as, as watching it. So. so it was kind of a struggle at first. And then, um, yeah, there was a, a lot of things that I just were choices from the author that I didn't understand. And so like, even if I could enjoy the, the jokes, I couldn't focus on them because, you know, the other like storytelling things that, you know, didn't make sense to me, distracted me from that, I guess. Someone in chat says, uh, I, it was chock full of sarcasm. So I would understand why Carrie wouldn't like it. <laughs> Generally like British sci-fi, I have seen both the 1981 and the 2005 Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movies, as well as read the book previously. And it strikes me that absurdism is one of the hallmarks of British humor, especially sci-fi, because I saw the Good Omens series on Amazon Prime. It's a great a series. The sidebars in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy hit a lot of the humorous sidebar humors in Good Omens. Now, Good Omens is less hostile to religion than, say, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but, like, here's this really amazing Babel fish. It solves all our translation problems. It proves God. No, I'm going to argue it disproves God because God wouldn't let something so dark and convenient exist. I'm like, yeah, this reminds me of Good Omens. In Good Omens, you have the good and the evil fighting, and you actually have you know, the angels going over the Antichrist and the fighting, and you have this throwaway reference of God's playing a game, but it's like dice and cards being played in the dark. Now you end up with God has a plan, and the angels and the demons don't even realize they're not part of it, but you get the absurdity of they think they've got a plan, but it's not God's plan. God's plan is something else altogether different. Yeah, one thing I love about uh, Good Omens is they the angels and the demons don't really know where God is and haven't talked to God. Also, <laughs> like they're not really less in the dark than the humans who are like feel like they don't know what's going on. They also kind of just don't know what's going on. But different story. <laughs> My first impressions are about uh, 30 years old, but still pretty much clear as day. I was about uh, 13, 14 when I first read it. And um, yeah, it didn't take any getting into for me. I was there. But, you know, I'm a Brit. We are a bit wonky. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was genuine. It was uh, 79 when it came out as a book, but it was a um, really popular radio show first. So um, I definitely recommend listening to the original radio show. It stands up as well today as it did. And it was definitely shoehorned into novel form. Um, but I think it was very successful how we did it. I, I wanted to ask you, like, because I haven't heard the, the radio shows, but um, does it kind of go along the same lines as the novel or is there a lot in the novel that isn't in, in the shows? No, it's very, very similar. Um, and it's got that very um, English uh, soundstage um, 
I mean, if you think Doctor Who and that kind of um, sort of sound development, and whatever, uh, the BBC was very um, ahead of its time for that sort of thing. And it's still batshit crazy. But um, yeah, I mean, hearing the very definite voices of the characters, you know, and how odd they are. There's one thing I want to ask everyone, um, because um, Ford Prefect is named after a car. Um, did you have the Ford Prefect in the States or was that just a, a British thing? I don't think we had the Prefect. No. I don't remember it. I don't remember <laughs> it in the States. It would have been a small crappy car if it was in the UK back in the 70s. We had the Pinto, which I think might have been, was that a Ford, Kerry? Do you remember? Was it a Ford Pinto? Yeah. That was our crappy Ford small car. What about anyone yeah, who has spoken? Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I wonder if uh, there's quite a number of references there that would be um, particularly typically English that might have passed you guys by uh, quite a bit. Um, because so many elements of the um, like self-deprecating humour and um, Arthur Dent are, um, you know, particularly relevant if you're from the British Isles, for sure. I don't know. I mean, I grew up in America. I still love that humor. So I don't, I think it's just a personality thing, right? I think there's just something, you know, um, I don't, who was just saying that, I think it was Wes was saying, like reading about Mo poking Curly in the eyes or whatever is different than watching Mo poke Curly in the eyes. And um, I don't know, for me, I actually get a lot out of, when I, I actually prefer, I think I actually prefer jokes written. Like I actually, I might prefer reading about that than I would watching it. And I, I don't know if that's just a weird thing, but like I, the book Princess Bride, I love the movie, but the book's better. Um, and like, it's, I, I view this as like a similar kind of, like I hated the movie for this book, uh, the, the most recent one. And I love, um, Alan Rickman and like it could like it had the right elements to be a movie that I would like but I didn't like it I haven't listened to the radio show though so uh, thanks thanks Matt for sharing that about uh, that the Ford prefect was a car in Britain because I um, missed that reference um, but I like you I read this about 30 years ago and loved it but I really like the BBC miniseries especially like that picture of Arthur Dent in his bathrobe going around the universe just stuck in my head is really hysterical. I really enjoyed the BBC miniseries. I didn't like what they did much with the movie, but I too like Monty Python. So I don't know what the, <laughs> what the difference is between some people who like Monty Python and don't like this. I, it's not what you expect. Um, it is absurd. I mean, just that the answer to, which actually they didn't know, said they didn't know the question to life, the universe and everything is 42. But then they asked about the question, but they should have known what the question was. It's just the answer is totally absurd. And, but one of the things um, I really, I noticed this time is the criticism of the uh, Vogon's poetry that's a total yeah. attack against literary criticism and it means nothing. And that's literary criticism. My opinion means nothing. It just doesn't say anything. Else. So, yeah. So that, I, there's I, a similar I, attack I, I on do, philosophers, I, which I, I love. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and the uh, proving of God like that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that was funny. That was funny. Manny, you haven't said anything this time. I was very happy that I could read that book really fast. I started reading it like on Friday night because I, I was so busy with work and stuff. So I read it and it was a lot faster to read than all the other books, I guess, because it was more like, so like you said, it was so crazy. Uh, it seemed like uh, everything was chance and everything that would happen would be like Murphy's law happening or, you know, something that go wrong. It would, I mean, it, it, it was, it was interesting. I, I didn't necessarily dislike the book. I, I thought that uh, 
<laughs> that it was just interesting to see what was happening. And then I did laugh a little bit when I would read some crazy stuff like the mice were the most intelligent life form, life form in the world, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, but sometimes you wonder, right? We live in a world with a lot of other types of creatures in life. And obviously we can't necessarily communicate with all of them. We assume that they're not as smart as us. Obviously we understand our, each other, but who knows? Maybe there is some, some truth to it, right? Some, some of those things, some other, other creatures live in our world that are, might be smart too. And, you know, it was a creative way, I guess, of, of putting a story together in my, my view. Um, I was happy that I didn't have to read the whole five books because at first I was like, oh my God, there's yeah. like five books in there. And it was just the first, uh, the first uh, book. So it was, it was interesting. I, I read it Friday night and ended it and finished it yesterday. So I had not seen it or heard anything about it before. Yeah, I kind of came into it cold too. I didn't know anything about it really. I've never seen any of the films or anything and didn't know anything about Douglas Adams. I think he was kind of um, in some ways trying to point to what you're saying about other creatures, about hum this human arrogance that puts us sort of at the center of the universe. And yeah, um, but ultimately one of the things I, I wondered, it made me wonder does, cause I was reading this again, I knew nothing about him. And I was kind of like, I think one of the things I didn't like about it was just, it felt pointless to me. It felt pointless and meaningless. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Matt? <laughs> I get that that's his point. I get that that's his point. And, but it started to feel like, well, if you're trying to say that everything is meaningless and, and a matter of chance, and, and then why even should I finish your book? And I, and then I was like, I wonder if this guy's an atheist. And I looked, and of course he's like Obviously. a very passionate atheist. So I was thinking, what does anybody, um, what, like to what extent does a person's faith affect their opinion of this book and does it at all are there any are there any uh christians who really love it in the chat i'm a christian and i love it and you love it Chiquita. i love well, it there you go <laughs> i by the way i liked it when i was a christian really and okay that, that, yeah well interesting hasn't I was, changed I, I was trying to figure out why i didn't like it and i was like is that is that one reason i don't know uh, well the I'm, absurdity I'm, is intentional right and he explains the happenstance by this impossible this improbability drive right so the the idea is he introduces this thing based on like there was a revelation in physics that like the, that probability played a role in a lot of things and i spent you know a bunch of college trying to calculate the position of a particle in the well or whatever like there's a lot of this like uh, very, very low, basically negligible, negligible probability stuff that could theoretically happen. And he kind of went into that and used it as a, as a device to just make an absurd world where like he always falls back on this explanation of like, well, they have an improbability drive, like things happen that are improbable. And I know that's a trite explanation and it's not super deep, but it's just for me, it's just like this romp of fun. Like there's no point. He's not trying to say life is meaningless. He's just being funny. Like I don't, it's like, I don't watch, I don't watch the Holy Grail and come away thinking, yeah, they make some good points. Like that's not, the, that's not the goal. Well, I, one thing I got from the reading the book, it's not necessarily maybe the point he wants to make, but sometimes as people, we, we sort of make up our minds or judge or decide on something that is happening. And we're like, oh, it's because of this, or we have a certain view. And when you end up finding out why things are, they are, is like completely out of left field, completely different than anything that you thought about. And I think, I mean, obviously he had, he had that happening in this book all the time. So it keeps you wondering. I mean, it makes you at least think that, you know, it's everything is not always like you think it is. There's always, it could be much different. Even you, even if you're convinced that something is a certain way, it might not. Yeah, he really leans into that. I mean, there's the element where Arthur um, shouts something when they're on Magrathea and a wormhole opens, drags his words to the far side of the galaxy, causes an interstellar war. They decide to wage <laughs> war on the... Um, on the earth and they arrive and due to a miscalculation of scale are eaten by a small dog. It's like yeah. nothing is as it should be or as it potentially seems to be. 
I think for him, you know, he mocked religion, but he'll mock science and philosophy as much as there are no sacred cows. That that's his uh, sort of take on things. I feel uh, with a yeah a wry look at things, uh, and I think he captures it really well. Hey, there's another vote in the, in the uh, private chat between those of us on on screen. Joe King, hi Joe. He says I'm hey. Catholic and I love it. Oh, it's hilarious. I mean, it is it is what everybody's saying. But I mean, really, if you think about, say, James Bond or something like that, Star Wars, th that's absurd. Seems like you. He pokes fun at science, religion, philosophy, everybody's fair game, equal opportunity. I, I loved it. You know, one thing that... Go ahead, go ahead. Was that Tamara? Who was that? I saw the unprobability drive as an absurdity generator, which is why you would have a quarter million eggs, lightly fried eggs show up on a planet where everybody's starving, or you're pulled out of a party into a rift into space. So a couple of analysts suffocate in space in the middle of a party because you have the balloons and the streamers and everything. It's like, no, it's not, it is an absurdity generator. And that's why you have so many weird things happen around it. It's an it's not just a plot device for going places they don't think they can find. It's a deliberate absurdity generator from its very foundation. Hence the find my you know, how do I create it? I calculate the odds and run it through the computer, and it material magically materializes. Its entire inception is absurdity generator. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that's not unique to this book, but I, I was struck by this because it's been a while since I read this. And uh, I was struck by how how often science fiction writers and I know he's not like an Arthur C. Clarke trying to actually predict what things will be like. But still, he's writing in this like futuristic or, you know, advanced technology world. And the book itself is fascinating to me because it's I guess supposed to sound super sophisticated and I'm like that kind of sucks compared to an iPhone like it it's it's supposed to be like he he has imagination for all these other things and yet the best thing he can think about for a book is like this little thing with a bunch of buttons on it and like it's like an encyclopedia kind of um I always I always find it interesting how wrong we are when we try and predict technology so when I was reading the book, something I thought about, and I'm pretty sure that I, I'm just going back into the actual story itself. This trillion lady that is with, uh, with uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, the, I forget all the names. Seifad. Yeah, Seifad. She is the woman that was at in the, in the that uh, Arthur had met at the, that party and he was upset about that she sort of disappeared on him, right? Right? That was, yeah. That was her. And she yeah. sort of left the, the she planet Earth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yep. I also love the bureaucracy thing. Like the, the yeah. idea that like he's struggling with this bureaucracy for his house and no one cares. And then like, I don't know, the idea that like, oh, there's actually this bigger bureaucracy that we're not even aware of. And they care just as little as the bureaucracy in the UK cares about Arthur Dent's house and then also the inefficiency and ridiculousness of it, given that like five minutes later, the bypass isn't actually necessary anymore. Like the whole thing is just this commentary on how inefficient and stupid we are at like bureaucracies. That opening scene is one of my favorites where um, Ford convinces the, the uh, foreman to stand in, to sit in front of the tractor while he's, he goes off. It's just really funny. Yeah, I love that. And it, wasn't it also sort of the same thing happening in terms of the, the planet Earth was being destroyed because they needed it for a highway or something like in super highway in space right. or something like that similar to what happened to Arthur's house. It was a parallel. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. And then minutes later, it wouldn't have mattered anymore. Yeah. Bureaucratically. Yeah. I also well, like that the worst poetry was actually some chick from England. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I don't know, just stupid little things like that. I I really enjoyed. Now, that was kind of funny in the beginning, like the opening of the book, but it kind of came back uh, towards the end too with, uh, you know, instead of destroying his house, they're destroying the planet Earth. That was one of the uh, the things that didn't make sense to me because if the Earth was was created and built, you know, millions of years ago to answer these all important questions, like how is it that the mice didn't keep track of that and like weren't aware of it or, you know, everybody really, and why is it that Earth only had this one small, like little sentence that it was mostly not harmful in the in the guide? So, I mean, things like that, it's like, well, how is it that, you know, people aren't, aren't aware that this shouldn't be destroyed, you know? So it kind of, like, it throws me out of the story, things like that, I guess. I thought it said that the, the constructor fleet um, did it 10 minutes early. Didn't they say that at the end? That it was destroyed 10 minutes early. They were supposed to wait. And that's why they're going to create another Earth, because they had to wait 10 million years again to, to find out what the question was. They had to redo the program. I'm not, no, I'm not sure if they were early or not. I just, you know, it, it just threw me that, you know, why was it being destroyed at all? If it was something that, you know, this grand plan that had been set, set in motion millions of years ago to, you know, and there were even like these um, uh, philosophical like agencies, I guess, or organizations that, you know, you know, felt it was very important. So you would think that, you know, that would have been passed down to, you know, protect the earth, I guess. I think you're thinking a bureaucracy is rational. That's that's the problem. <laughs> if they needed it for a bypass, the same at the house. I love that scene in the beginning too, where he says the government says, uh, "Well, the plans have been available in Proxima Century for six months. Why didn't you just move?" He's talking about like the earth, all the Earthlings. You should have just moved. We let you know. Well, yeah. well, one thing. Oh, sorry. One thing that um, that um, I was thinking about is that. The, they're trans-dimensional beings. They're not part of the regular galaxy. So I don't think the galaxy really knew of the purpose of Earth and they kind of shunned it. And it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't well known. So them destroying Earth wasn't really, and of course the bureaucracy and everything too. So anyway, that's just my thoughts on why it wasn't well known about Earth. And of course the Earth fleets weren't aware. So those are just my you know. Anyway, yeah. there's definitely a lot Thank of cynicism you. in the book too, right? Because at the end, the mice are like, they really just want the question so they can go on tour and make some money. And like, they just in five minutes, they come up with a question that they think works anyway, and like, screw this whole project of making another earth. There's definitely like a lot of built in cynicism in this book that basically everything is kind of absurd and, and nothing's really working. I just wanted to read a couple of comments from the chat. Um, Marby Dog, who seems to share my part of my opinion, says reading a book is a larger intellectual investment than watching a movie. The book has this book has less payoff than the Holy Grail. I, I kind of agree with that. I just felt like after a certain point. But then this guy, Brendan McWalters. Hi, Brendan. He disagrees about the pointlessness part. He says, Carrie, I would argue the book is not a nihilist tract that the patent absurdity doesn't preclude the presence of meaning, care, love in the world. And it makes a great argument for faith. He says the difference between faith and reason requires the leap, i.e. the practice of the faith in the face of calamities. So Dent sticking to his English values in the face of crazy events of the universe is an argument that one has to have values and stick to them. I don't think so, Brendan, but I wanted to read your comments. <laughs> I think Brendan should be critiquing some Vogon poetry right about now, but. <laughs> no, but I like you. I like that you have a different take than me because I didn't get that out of it. I didn't get that it, that he thinks faith is important. I don't think Douglas Adams thinks faith is important, but I dig that you do. Okay. Come on, Arthur <laughs> was there just about to be flushed out of an airlock and uh, Ford goes, aha. And Arthur's like, oh, you have a solution? Ford's like, oh, no, I was just kidding. And he keeps oh, that the was pretty right funny. until the last moment. Yeah. It, when and he then says... they are washed out of the airlock. And then 29 seconds in, just before they expire, they're just rescued. So nothing is yeah. hopeless. See, but that, that made me think of... Well, first of all, I thought that was funny when he says, oh, wait, we might be 
what's that switch over there? You know? And then he's like, nah, I'm just kidding. I thought that's funny. I love that kind of joke. But, um, but then what you just said about how then they're like immediately rescued, it reminded me of, uh, and I know it's not lazy writing. I know he's did this on purpose. He's, it is, it's supposed to be absurd, but it, there were just too many moments for me where it felt like it's like watching a movie and um, what there's a there's a word for this. Anybody know screenwriting? There's a there's a phrase for this where you have some improbable thing happen that saves the day that doesn't make any sense. Deus I'm a guffin. Ex- no, that's the thing everyone's trying oh. to get. Oh, okay. Deus ex machina is the thing that saves everyone and comes yes. out of left field. What is that called again, Alex? Deus ex machina. Okay. Ghost of the machine. God, it's the god and the machine, right? Yeah. It's interesting. It actually comes from uh, studying Greek uh, drama because wow. it's in Medea. They th- at the end of the play, there's like there's no way for Medea to get out, and then all of a sudden, this big contraption comes down and grabs her and swoops her up. And the only way you can accomplish that is through stagecraft. That's why they call it Deus Ex Machina. So you felt like it was a bunch of that, Carrie. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. That's why I said, I guess maybe I just have different expectations for a book. Like Marby Dog said, if I'm going to put more that much investment into uh, into it, I don't have, it's not that much investment to sit and watch an episode of My Python or, but to read a book, I'd, I want to be, I guess I'm looking for something else. I want to be hooked into the characters and what happens to them. And, and this is more just like absurdist, silly kind of like, I guess you could put this book um, next to the toilet for people who just want to read something real quick while they're in the bathroom. <laughs> I, I'm going to go replace my copies of the U.S. Constitution uh, in the bathroom with Douglas Adams now. I kind of agree with, with uh, what Carrie was saying because, like, even right at the beginning, like, there wasn't a lot of character development in that, you know, it's never really explained why... Um, uh, he he decides to say if Ford was the alien, right? Yeah. And he yeah he decides to uh, save Arthur, but I mean it didn't seem like they were even that close. Like clearly he didn't trust Arthur enough to let him know that he was an alien, and but he went out of his way to go to his house and then bring him to the pub and you know save him. But why? And I mean the, I know the reason is because you know the story demanded it. There needed to be a, someone from Earth and someone not from Earth, you know, to play off of each other. But, um, you know, it's not it's not clear from the story or, you know, why he would have chosen him to do that. I'd say that when a story goes into absurdist comedy, that I don't care about the reasons why anything happens. Because I know that, like, you know, uh, Harpo pulls out a cup of coffee from his you know, coat. I'm not going to question why he has a cup of coffee, like an actual saucer of coffee that's hot in his coat because it's literally impossible. So I don't care why anything happens in an absurdist comedy. I'm not, I don't even ask those questions. I will if, if there's any sense of like realism to it, but I don't like, this is too absurd for me to really, it set the tone that I don't ask those questions. And also, it's only the opening um, act, really, isn't it? You know, it's a trilogy in five parts. So um, it was originally a a radio serial and it was just ongoing, you know, building on. So um, it has that kind of like episodic feel. Um, And when it gets, you know, it does have a nice circular um, conclusion to it uh, by the the end of Mostly Harmless, which was written many, many years after um, the first uh, four were. And, you know, the absurdity continues. I mean, uh, by the third one, they're uh, navigating their way across the galaxy by the power of um, restaurant bills and who sorts them out. That's, it can't get much more absurd than that. So, Matt, you're saying Carrie needs to read the other four books now? Is that what you're suggesting? I think she needs to go back, read the first one properly, and then finish the other four. So yeah. listen and then to I want a five... <laughs> listen to Stephen Pryor read essay it. On my, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> you know, I was listening to the Jack Benny radio show recently. Like, uh, there was some Spotify channel or something that I was listening to where they play old radio pr- plays. And 
then there were a bunch of other, I forget who they were. There's Jack Benny one. And then I listened to some other ones that aren't as commonly known from the forties and fifties, I guess. And they're like that. They're like this. They're silly. They're absurdist. And you're entertained. And, and I, I get it in that form. It makes perfect sense to me that this was a radio play. I wanted yeah. to ask it. I wanted to ask if anybody knew there was like a, a few times in the book where he he said you know something happened by a coincidence like the uh, the um, backwater planet or whatever where the they were storing the uh, that ship that Zaffel Zaffed uh, uh box stole where France is. Yeah, so I didn't know if that was like really a coincidence or if that was like there was something going on where he, that was actually a story choice to make that represent France, if anybody knew that. I think it's just um, part of the infinite improbability. So they're just random things. Um, he just sprinkles them about. There's no uh, deeper meaning to it at all. He's, uh, yeah, just poking fun. Yeah, don't don't look too deeply. You won't find any uh, sense in there. Yeah, I thought that was just another absurd thing. It's just part of the whole absurdity. Like he never explains why do you have to destroy Earth to make a bypass? Like it, it's a shorter path through a wormhole, and you know a planet is so tiny compared to space. The whole thing's just ridiculous. And as soon as you try to pick that apart. It's like trying to analyze the plot of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Kind of reminds me of that. Like, why did they do this? Why did they do that? Like, don't even try. Just laugh. I listened to the Audible version, which is hilarious. The, the speaker in the Audible version is great. With, with a, It goes between the different British accents the whole time. I think I would have had trouble reading it if I read it. Because I, I kept putting it down and forgetting it and thinking, Where's he going with this? I had to back up two chapters because I'm lost. Finally, I just stopped and just was amused and just listened to it all the way through. Maybe the don't panic was really for all of us reading it. Just to don't take it too seriously. Just buckle up and, <laughs> and don't take it too seriously. You know, somebody mentioned about keeping in the bathroom. I've been, I've never read it. I didn't know much about it. My sister's been trying to get me to read this my entire life. She has a copy on the nightstand next to her guest bedroom. I guess I finally read it. So. It is silly. It's late reading, I guess. Yeah, I don't view it like I know, I've heard a couple of people say like it's not worth the investment for me, but like reading like this is just, I don't know. It's like, if I sit down and read for a couple hours, it's like watching a movie and like I get the payoff out of it. Like for me personally, the payoff is like, yeah, I enjoyed myself. Like there's a lot of crappy movies. Uh, <laughs> this is this is better than a lot of movies. So like it's not a the investment just doesn't seem like a big deal to me. But I get that, you know, I don't know. I, I get that that's not true for everyone. But I, I it is just absurd and silly. There's nothing I get out of it. Like it doesn't. It, <laughs> feed my soul in any meaningful way or like give me insights into the universe. He does I, I like, I like the cynical jokes. part of it. Like at restaurant at the end of the universe, one of those sections is, you know, we want to order dinner and it's well, what's the animal, what's the meat. And they bring out an intelligent creature genetically engineered to be able to consent to being consumed. Like and a suicidal Earth, cow, right? Yes. And Arthur is horrified to be talking to this creature. He says, don't worry, sir. I completely consent. They made me to make sure I can consent. I promise to kill myself humanely. That is one yeah. of the best parts in one of the other books. And uh, BBC does a really good job of that. Uh, I think it's a slig or something uh, that they call it. But there are some really clever things in the other books that you miss out, but, and that's one of them um, that you miss out. And there's one section in one of the books. So I'm listening to them. I really enjoy listening to them. I get tired of all these intellectual podcasts I'm listening to. And this is just fun. But there was one thing where they uh, talked about time travel and how somebody wrote these really famous poems and stuff, but then they decided, oh, 
in the future that these poems need to be edited. So they go back and they give him different poems and then it changes everything and it changes <laughs> because time travel, frankly, is absurd. So <laughs> it, it was really funny how they uh, changed things. So there was one section I wanted to bring up that reminded me of um, a politician currently, well, around. So this is, do you mind if I read a little bit? It's not too long. Please. So, uh, oh, yes. David Brevelbrox, adventurer, ex-hippie, good timer, crook, quite possibly, manic self-publicist, terribly bad at personal relationships, often thought to be completely out to lunch. President, only six people in the entire galaxy understood the principle on which a galaxy was governed and they knew that once Zafid Bibabrox had announced his intention to run as president it was more or less a fate accompli. He was a deal presidential fodder. Presidential fodder. Does that sound like anybody we know? I was like, Boy, yeah. that doesn't sound like Trump. <laughs> I like that part. I thought of Trump too and I, and or just the presidency in general how it said, you know, the, the president's main job is is not to be a person who holds power, but to distract the people from where the power is actually held. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah. <laughs> to be a distraction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this doesn't okay. have to be a long book club. Let Are me, there okay, any let other me, thoughts? I mean, I, uh, yeah. Let me throw out a question. I'm still trying to figure out what, what do those of us who didn't enjoy it in book form have in common? Do you guys like Woody Allen films? So like, I, I have a, no, Carter's shaking his head no. I, no. I, I really, it's taken me a while to to grow a little appreciation for a few Woody Allen films. But for the most part, I find this, again, probably unpopular. I find him kind of pretentious. And um, the way that he uses language is sometimes, yeah, yeah, it's funny, but it's also, to me, it's like a person showing off, especially when, his, when he's playing a character and, and um, I, I don't know, some, some of it reminded me of that a little bit. And uh, now everyone who loves Woody Allen can hate on me. <laughs> Actually, well, I, Carrie, this, this is interesting. I really want you now to listen to the radio program because I'm wondering if it's just the medium. And I this is because because you and I both like Monty Python and like and now yeah. I'm learning that we both really don't like Woody Allen. It might just be the way it's presented. It might just be like certain people. This medium doesn't work for them for this. And you kind know of what? Humor. Funny enough, my favorite Woody Allen film is the most absurdist. It's What's Up, Tiger Lily, where he takes a foreign film and just dubs over the language with nonsense. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that kind of like uh, Kung Pao Enter the Fist? I don't know if anybody's ever seen that movie. That's an awesome movie. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's also a new, there's this thing that came out. Uh, I just found out about it yesterday. Just my friend's into it. But it's a it's a dubbing of a anime TV show that was not going to do well here. So it's a crazy dub. They said, change the, the lines to whatever you want to make the cell. So like what it was is that the director of the dub said, whichever voice actor gets here first gets to decide the subject and the tone of the scene. So, and it's, it's called Ghost Stories. It's available on Amazon Prime. I'm about to start it. Cause I was like, okay, I've seen some screenshots. It's freaking crazy. And it is a lot like, you know, come pow, enter the fist that, you know, crazy, silly kind of shit going on. What is Kung Pao Enter the Fist? It's a movie? Yeah, so he took old samurai films and he CGI'd himself into them. And he's the chosen one. He doesn't have a name. So it's it's also, it references things like The Lion King and uh, exploitation films. And it's really, it's absurdist. It's so silly. He fights a cow at one point. So it's it's really crazy and hilarious. Um, and then they do like over the top reactions and stuff and like uh, short dubbing for something that's obvious that they talked a lot and then like wander stuff, you know, like they, they just like really play with it and it's really funny. So is anyone gonna uh, go and give the radio show a try then? I'm gonna check it out. 
Wow. Worthwhile. It's, it, it's the original medium it was intended for. It's what he was happiest with. Um, he did say that um, he um, he didn't like Arthur, didn't like Zayfard, and he didn't like Ford. He thought they're all stupid. That's the, and that was the author. <laughs> Any other Woody Allen comments from the people like Carrie who don't like the book? What do you guys think about Woody Allen? I, I can't say that I've seen any of his movies, so I don't really, I'm not really familiar with his work, I guess. Wow, we're an uncivilized lot. Okay. Aren't we supposed to like Woody Allen? <laughs> I think we can't get invited to the right places in LA now, but yeah. other than that, I think we're okay. Unlike Carter, I liked the movie even after. Oh, you the, did? Like the newest version, the newest one. Um, and I think it was because Marvin was exactly the way that I pictured his personality anyway. He was just like, Eeyore in droid form. It was so funny. And um, so you might, if you, you might give the movie a try, just most of the time, it's not the bo the book's better than the movie, but it might. The new one or the old one? The new one with um, Alan Rickman. Ape and I forget his name. And uh, Morgan Freeman. Bilbo not and, Morgan Freeman. Um, yeah. Martin and Death Freeman, Post Death. Right? Martin Freeman. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. so I saw that when it came out. That was my first experience of Hitchhiker's Guide. And the hilarious thing is, is that when I picked up this book, every single time I the the song started playing in my head. So long and thanks for all the fish because they had that whole musical number for the dolphins. So like every single time I picked up the book, that it just played in my head. And I'm like, I've not watched that movie in quite a long time. And apparently that tune is very very catchy. Huh. I kind of wanted to go back to a, a passage. I think it was Tamara who brought it up kind of at the beginning where um, they're talking about the babble fish. And that like that section kind of was interesting to me because I think in real life, there's kind of this tendency on both sides, both, you know, uh, atheists and Christians to there's this notion that God and science can't exist in the same universe. Whereas um, uh, atheists will kind of say, you know, because we're starting to answer all these questions scientifically, it kind of disproves the, the existence in God. And on the other side, on the Christian side, there's, you know, this tendency to want to, you know, deny scientific discoveries because that threatens their their belief system. And I think that was something that came up in one of the, uh, the streams one time. Uh, Gary had kind of said that there was, a, uh, you know, these people were like kind of choosing the genetics of their baby. And there was like kind of a worry that that was like playing God. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know what you guys thought about that. Because I mean, to me, I don't think, I don't think, you know, I believe that God and science can both exist in the same, in the same space. Yeah, I belong to a group that uh, believes that science and faith are allies. So, um, you know, there are different groups in, Christ in Christianity, some who don't accept um, the Big Bang uh, because they think the, you, you know, the universe is only six to 10,000 years old, but the group I belong to um, believes in, you know, agrees with science and the Big Bang and actually says that, you know, the Bible said that, you know, um, the heavens and earth were created out of nothing, which is what science says with the Big Bang. And Bible said it a longer time ago. There's a lot more stuff too, but. Um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> you have to be picky about which group of Christians you're talking about. I remember Carrie was talking about a group of homeschoolers that the, uh, maybe like a week or two ago that didn't want anything explained about dinosaurs and things like that. And um, 
I homeschooled my kids for 20 years and I didn't teach them. <laughs> I wouldn't agree with anything that they wanted um, to be taught. So um, we believe in dinosaurs millions of years ago. So. But we don't think that any of that um, negates the existence of God. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I don't, I guess I don't really understand. I know they exist. I get the people who think that the, that you can't believe science and in creation, but I don't understand that. I don't think they contradict one another. So I'm on the same page with you guys. I think it's just some Christians are very literal with their interpretation of the Bible. And so if, if there's a literal contradiction, like six days, then they, you know, they're going to stick to that. Right. So, you know, and then other Christians are viewing it as more of a metaphorical thing. I think like Deb is saying, and like, well, here's some things that do comport with science and like, and we're not going to get upset about six days. And the Bible doesn't say there wasn't dinosaurs. Right. So like it's, you know, but I, I, the part, just by the way, as an atheist, I don't think that it's scientific discovery that disproves, I don't believe that God needs to be disproved. Uh, so that's not my real, <laughs> I, I wouldn't argue that. But uh, I, I, the part I actually liked about the Babelfish the most was that this is some, it questions this assumption that we all kind of assume that if we can communicate better, we'll get along better. And the opposite was true. Like once people were able to talk to each other, there was a lot more wars. <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. Um, just uh, funny, but also kind of interesting because we don't really question this assumption that if we could just talk to each other more clearly, things would be better. Like maybe things wouldn't be better. <laughs> maybe we would find really deep disagreements. That's sometimes based on the narcissistic belief of, well, if you just understand them, you'll come to a conclusion. Well, if I've got two more species, maybe they can talk out a boundary that nobody crosses like the neutral zone but it denies the fact that you can have utterly conflicting objectives now a xenomorph talking to a human may talk but it doesn't mean they'll come to a solution or it may be something like hey give us tribute bodies once in a while it, it's a mistake it, it's kind of like the if we just listen and love we'll solve all the problems you're assuming everybody's got the same mindset including across species no yeah yeah no, the idea Sorry, that if you communicate to... better would cause more wars is, is funny because i always thought like people say well if everybody could just really understand each other they would all get along like if you could read everybody's mind do you think that would be better like everybody get along people be fighting every day that would be terrible it's hard enough to communicate within a family or, or friends that you know, because you both come from, two people come from completely different backgrounds with completely different contexts. And no matter how hard you try, you're still going to misunderstand. Communication is the hardest thing in marriage. It, you know, I've been married for 40 years, okay? And it's still hard to communicate. <laughs> It's kind of proof that you can hear and understand the exact words that anybody says and still take different meaning from them. It doesn't guarantee that one person's understanding is the same as another, hence the war. Especially if you're talking about boots in Britain or torches or anything else that we use different words for. Yeah. Is there anybody who didn't get a chance to speak yet who wanted to say something? Shade, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. I think you're the only person who didn't speak, but you don't don't feel any pressure to. Um, okay, this could be yeah, a short I, one. I'm, I'm happy to wrap it up. I yeah. just look, I'll be honest, guys. I like the book. I, I think I pushed for it, but no one really pushed back at all. I just wanted a break for a month. So I, 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 some I frivolity it was, it was good, fine it was a good choice i think it was a good choice uh carter i mean like there was an easy read <laughs> so sometimes we're living in this world that's going nuts on us and you're all stressed out and you're thinking about all the terrible things that are happening and you need to get like 
mindless distraction. That's what I wanted. <laughs> it was an easy read. It was an easy read. To tell you the truth, now I want to see the movie too. Just to see how they portray it. Just to... You know. Don't yeah. do it, man. Seriously, don't do it. Don't do it's it. Awful. <laughs> don't do it. Listen to the radio really play. Bad. No. Or listen no, to no. the radio play. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Just yeah. to see. I mean, you, you. Somebody was commenting that it was Martin Freeman was the was the character, and now that I think about it, I can imagine him in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> So the original, is, um, the original miniseries um, shot in the eighties was really good. That's. I mean, it, it looks pretty wonky. The uh, the sets are awful and the budget is low, but um, it's very yeah. much the spirit of the uh, radio shows and the books. So that, that's, that's what Deb said too. Well. Yeah. Cool. Do it all. Do it all. All of them. Well, um, this reminded me of when we did Screw Tape Letters, which I loved, and Carter did not like. <laughs> that's true carter did not like that one at all and i was yes. like wow i'm gonna be dropping a bomb in this one carrie didn't like this book but carter but it, it's funny it's okay to each, to each their own um <laughs> thank you guys for joining us today and yeah. if you're if it's your first time watching and you're watching this later or something you can find out about what what book we're reading currently at unsafespace.com on the book club page this coming month we're going to be doing jordan peterson's beyond order so that's going to be, I'm very excited for this one. Yeah, that one is going to be a little bit more meaningful. Hopefully, <laughs> meaningful. Yes, that one will be less absurd. And uh, Manny won't be able to get away with starting it on Friday night. But yeah, no, no, I uh, neither. That. This time I was stressing out. I'm like, oh my God. I have book. Yeah, but and funny I enough. I started reading it. And I'm like, went like this. It's fast. Yeah. Funny enough, I hear the answer to the universe is also 42. Yes. In that book. I'm kidding. That's I'm sure it is. Well, what's the question? That's yeah, that's his third book. All right, guys. Um <laughs> thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it, everyone. And um yeah, we will see you for the next book club a month from now and for coffee break tomorrow. So uh take care. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the cathedral. Pay no attention to it. The following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. As a reminder, continued association with cancelled individuals is strictly prohibited. Violators will be subject to fair and objective sentencing, which may include cancellation, re-education, and compassionate liquidation. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Did you know that deer no longer wear Kevlar vests? Only we do that. So you won't need that silly thing anymore. Why not hand it over? Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.